This is the beginning of The Wall Creeper. This is the original American edition I'm reading from. I was looking at the map when Stephen swerved, hit the rock, and occasioned the miscarriage. Immediately obvious was my sticky forehead. Maybe I was unconscious for a couple of seconds. I don't know. Eventually, I saw Stephen poking around the front of the car and said, Jesus, what was that? He leaned in at the window and said, Hey, you're, you're bleeding. Hold on a second. He crossed behind the car, looked both ways, and retrieved the bird from the opposite ditch. I opened the door. I put my feet outside, threw up, and lay down, not in the vomit, but near it. The fur tops next to me had their roots at the bottom of a cliff. Can I use this bread bag? Stephen asked. Tiff? Tiff? He kneeled next to me. That was stupid of me. I shouldn't touch you after handling this bird. Can you hear me? Tiff? He helped me into the back seat, and I lay down on the bread. He said head wounds always bleed like that. I said he should have kept quiet. I lost the ability to see and began to hyperventilate a bit. The car pulled back onto the road. From the passenger seat, the wall creeper said, Cheep. Open the bag, I cried. Cheep. It said again. Stephen pulled over and busied himself with it for a moment. He said, I thought it was dead. I just wanted to get it off the road. I was going to have it prepared or something. I don't know. You should see its wings. For me, it's a lifer. It's the most wonderful bird, but it's a species of least concern. And actually, they're all over the place, except any place you would actually go. I identified it even before I hit it. Tichodroma muraria. It was unmistakable, just like I said it would be. So this is great. Dead is not a tick, as far as I'm concerned. I identified it before I hit it anyway. It really is unmistakable. You should see it, Tiff. I'm rambling on like this because you might have a concussion and you're not supposed to sleep. Put on music. The wall creeper protested. I stayed awake by retching, and Stephen drove defensively but swiftly back to Interlaken. When I awoke, I mean, the next time I was allowed a cup of coffee, Stephen steadied my hand on the mug and said, I have a surprise for you, but it's in the kitchen. I don't think I can get up. Well, he can't come in here. It will have to wait. I slurped, and he winced. I drank more quietly. Said the wall creeper. You didn't. I laughed, but my, what am I going to call it? My down there plays a minor role in several scenes to come. It appeared to be connected to the underside of my stomach with shock cords stretched too tight. I rolled over on my side and coughed. I wasn't pregnant, I noticed. I clenched my hands into claws and cried like a drift log in heavy surf. Stephen put his hands on my ears. Much later, he told me he thought if I couldn't hear myself, I might stop. He said it reminded him of feedback mounting in an amplifier. No, a flashback. Our first meeting prevented a crime. He saw me standing in front of the open gate of the vault. I had an armful of files. My hips were thrust forward. One wee foot in belly slippers was rubbing the instep of the other. My skirt was knee length and plaid, and my blouse was white and roomy. And I was thinking, if I move fast, I can grab the files on that stuff they used to euthanize psychotics and be down the stairwell in 10 seconds. I was a typist at a pharmaceutical company in Philadelphia. The vault was where the bodies were buried, and there was no one inside. A, a, a vault is a file room that has a great big heavy gate on it with a combination lock. The vault was where the bodies were buried, and there was no one inside, except Stephen, who walked up and asked my name. Tiffany, he said. That means a divine revelation from Theophany. It means a lampshade, I said. It's a way to get around the problem of putting your light under a bushel. The light and the bushel are one. He didn't back away. It was one of those moments where you think, we will definitely fuck. It might take a while, though, because Stephen looked as respectable as I did. He was interviewing for a position in R&D in Bern, Switzerland. He pretended I was going to be this really difficult and challenging conquest. He wooed me with everything I ever mentioned favorably. Little Debbie marshmallow pies, nasturtiums, the sweet wine so dear to the palate of our shared idol Richard Nixon, a joke. Alban Berg, a joke he didn't get. He had no intention of going to Bern alone. My parents were unanimous. 
He's a keeper, they said. They just about kicked me into bed with him, so the first time we had sex was on their pull-out sofa. He was beautiful. It was hypnotic. I was sold.